everyone, and welcome to today's event in the series Poly Talks, Get Informed Before Elections. This series is co-hosted by Karam House and Israeli Politics Simplified. Karam House is a community-focused organization based in Tel Aviv. Since the beginning of COVID, they have focused on organizing outdoor and virtual events aimed to empower and engage Olim and young professionals in the city. Israeli Politics Simplified is a Facebook page dedicated to bringing Anglos in Israel unbiased, easy to understand information about Israeli politics and the upcoming election. I'm Meira Lerner, creator of the Israeli Politics Simplified page, and I will be your host for this and upcoming events in this series. It's very easy to get confused and overwhelmed by the information overload that we see from the campaigns leading up to elections. We know that you, the voters, care about the issues and want to gain a better understanding of the political and election system and what the parties plan to do to meet your needs in the next government. This election is a truly important one, and our goal is to help you feel prepared and knowledgeable when you step into the voting booth next month. In the past few weeks, we have spoken with candidates from many of the parties running this election. We've discussed real policy proposals and plans on issues that affect many of us in our day-to-day -day lives. Our approach to asking these questions and deciding what to focus on was very much influenced by the first event we did in the PolyTalk series, a discussion with former MK Rabbi Dove Littman, which helped frame what was going to be happening during this round of elections and what the campaigns would or should be focused on. Today, we are thrilled to have Rabbi Littman join us again right before election day to reflect on what's happened with the parties and campaigns over the last two months, analyze and predict what could happen on Tuesday, and help to guide us on how to decide who to vote for. Rabbi Littman was elected to Knesset as part of the Yesh Atid party in 2013 and served until 2015. While no longer affiliated with any political party, he currently serves as the Secretary General of the Confederation of United Zionists, as a political commentator for ILTV and I-24 News, and as a columnist for the Jerusalem Post and Times of Israel. With that, it is my privilege to welcome back former MK Rabbi Dov Littman. Welcome and thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Mira. Great to be with you again. So before we dive into some of the issues that uh, we're going to be focusing on today, can you give us like a very quick general overview of what's been going on, where things stand now, and what's going to be happening from here? Absolutely. Uh, just three things that I want to just mention. Number one is the New Hope Party, which originally was very much viewed as perhaps the messiah for the anti-Netanyahu camp has really spiraled downwards. I'm not saying that this should impact how people vote or don't vote. I'm just saying it's a fact on the ground that where they are polling right now uh, quite consistently and even single digits is a, is a startling development that has taken place. That's number one. Number two, uh, a lot of people have been wondering how can there be an anti-Netanyahu coalition? How could this come together? Uh, There's so many different personalities and who's gonna be prime minister and how this all work. Yair Lapid, the chairman of Yesh Atid, which is basically second in the polls by far, close to around 20 seats, he went into the Ynet studios this morning and said that for the sake of replacing Netanyahu, he is willing not to be prime minister. So that was essentially setting the stage for the possibility that maybe a Naftali Bennett or a Gidon Saar or a rotation could be prime minister and he would sit in that government supporting that person as prime minister. The third development is the fact that at the moment, again, for the, according to the polls, it does seem like Netanyahu at the moment has the clearest path towards the coveted number of 61 seats for a majority in the Knesset. Because when you put together the parties that have essentially said we are with him, that's Likud, the two Haredi parties, and the religious Zionism party, that gets him somewhere around 50, 51 seats possibly. And then if he's able to bring Yamina and Aftali Bennett on board, uh, that could be the easiest path that anyone has towards 61. And again, this is just based on the polls as we're seeing now, and anything can obviously happen on election day. Right. So I want to start off with doing not exactly rapid fire, but more quick paced questions. Um, I'd like to ask a question on every party, not every party, but a bunch of the parties kind of pointing out, you know, little things here and there that have been noticeable to me, certainly, and I'm, and I'm sure to many of our viewers um, that have been happening, you know, up until now in the campaigns and kind of get your take on, on some of those issues. So I'd like to actually start with Likud. Um, they, after starting off kind of low in the polls, they've picked themselves up and, and they actually seem pretty sure of themselves right now. And a big part of their focus during the campaigns have been on bringing the vaccines 
and uh, the Abraham Accord peace deals. And, and as they've gone up, it seems like those things are working. Is that really such a strong case for keeping BB around? And, and do you think that it'll work in the long term? It's very interesting. It's less from a intellectual sitting back and analyzing things perspective, but there's a large part of the population that goes to the polls and just whatever they're feeling uh, actually impacts who they vote for. So if they're happy when they go to the polls, then they'll say, okay, Netanyahu has made me happy. If they're unhappy when they're going to the polls, they'll say, he's the prime minister, he's made me unhappy. Look at what has happened over the last few days. My goodness, I'm seeing videos of concerts uh, taking place all over, including one where Netanyahu himself snuck up backstage and got on stage with the singer. And he, he said, you know, we've come back to life. We're smiling again. People, that, that, that touches people. And people are right now, even if people are struggling somewhat economically, even if people have suffered losses because of the health situation, uh, the fact that life is coming back to normal, that does have an impact. So Likud generally does a little bit better than the polls show. So if they're polling somewhere between 28 and 30 right now, don't be surprised if they end up somewhere in the 30 to 32 range uh, when it comes to election day. There's a lot of Likud tradition, uh, people who my father voted Likud, my grandfather voted Likud, and they might not talk to the pollsters that way, but when they go behind the booth, that also pulls them towards Likud. So I do believe that Likud is doing well, that they're strong, and that there is reason for their optimism. Okay, so now I'd like to focus on Likud and New Hope. Um, one thing that I've noticed quite a bit actually in a bunch of panels that I've seen and conversations that I've seen is that uh, Likud supporters and some of their MKs have kind of taken this approach to New Hope in saying that it's a family spat almost, you know, like there's a bunch of Likud people that left Likud and went to New Hope. And as we know, their, their numbers in the polls have shifted drastically from where they were at the very beginning. And, and I think I heard even this morning, somebody from Likud saying that they expect that a, at least a large number of the New Hope candidates will come back. Um, do you think that should be a real concern for people that are planning on voting for New Hope? Um, and do you see that happening? From the very beginning, as Birgitot Saar announced that after Zev Elkin left Likud and Sharana Skelb and others, Likud had a very deliberate strategy, which was, this is not Netanyahu against Saar. Saar's just this, I'm talking about the way he spoke about it, just this little uh, aberration, don't worry about it. And that enabled uh, Saar to essentially fall off the radar screen on a certain level. You know, if it was this real right-wing uh, debate between Netanyahu and Saar, I think that Saar would have gotten a lot more support as people wanted him to uh, replace Netanyahu. So the strategy 100% worked, downplaying it, making it not significant. And what's interesting is, I mean, you, you talked about will people leave from New Hope to join? I, I don't know that that, that that will happen. I know that uh, there's no doubt that the Likud camp will make tremendous offers for people, assuming that Netanyahu already has the 61 or is around the 61. And that's very tempting for, you know, if you're a young MK or a wannabe MK, and now all of a sudden you're being offered to be a minister of whatever it is, that is very tempting. They're gonna have to be very, very strong if they know that their party is likely heading to the opposition where you can basically do nothing and especially for a new party that's essentially built just to replace Netanyahu, it's going to be very hard for them to grow and be strong in the opposition. So there will be a Likud effort to do that. Uh, the New Hope people are still talking about will be the surprise of the election, you know, will go beyond the polls. And I have to mention, every single election, there is a brand new party that does better than everyone expected. I was the beneficiary of that in 2013 when we were the new kids on the block and we won 19 seats out of nowhere. Then after that, it was Kahlo's party. That's what happens throughout. There's these undecided voters in the middle who just go with the new phenomenon. I don't think that Saar has successfully really been on the map as the new phenomenon, but they still could possibly benefit from that last minute push of the undecided voters who go with the new party. I'd like to focus on uh, a couple of the more left-wing parties for a second here. Um, I found Labor's story to be incredibly interesting over this campaign. At the very beginning of the election season, so to speak, they were almost dead on arrival. I mean, they looked like they were almost going extinct. 
Um, and at this point, they seem to be pretty solidly over the threshold. Um, now many people have, have said that this is in large part because of Mirab Michaeli and, and them believing in her quite a bit. Um, but I think people are very confused at this point on where they really would go uh, in any potential government at this point. And I, I do want to bring this in because this was actually mentioned to me specifically the other day, and I think it's an important point. Um, number seven on the labor list specifically seems to be a very divisive figure in general. Uh, I'm sorry, Tisam Manara, I think her name is. Forgive me if I got that wrong, um, but it, she seems to be a, a pretty divisive figure. Um, and should she pass into the government, um, that could have an interesting implication on where labor would wind up in a coalition. So I'd really like to get your, your take on that in particular. So, sure. So in answering and understanding what's happening in labor, we have to remember this is the party which essentially, uh, with Ben Gurion at the helm, founded the state of Israel. Uh, this is a party with with real infrastructure, with branches around the country, and a little bit of a tradition as well. The reason why they essentially disappeared is because they joined the Netanyahu-led government with Benny Gantz. Uh, it was Amir Peretz and Itzik Shmuley. And that, for the average labor voter, was something which was unacceptable. Mirav Michaeli, who was number three, she couldn't uh, not be in the Knesset. She was elected to the Knesset, but she said, um, if my party's joining the government, I'm not part of that. And I think people really, uh, really uh, appreciated that stance. Mirav is very talented. I, I worked with her in the Knesset. She's certainly very capable as a leader, very ideologically driven, which uh, I don't think people appreciate as well. Uh, and that's what enabled uh, labor, you know, the, the, the branches that were all around the country that were just waiting uh, to not be written off completely, were able to rally around the new leader who they, uh, who they valued for not joining the Netanyahu-led government. So that's where you're seeing the six uh, seats from, it's because they do have that solid base. It's very important to point out that labor uh, over the last few decades has become more towards the center in terms of where they are politically, not rushing to say we'll make some kind of a deal with the Palestinians, against dividing Jerusalem, things along those lines, which were not typically in the more left we camp. Uh, Meirav is more left-wing, uh, but both politically, ideologically, uh, in general. So it's going to be an interesting balancing act. You mentioned number seven on the list. Even Meirav herself, it's not a simple point. So just as an example, they're going to join only the anti-Netanyahu camp. They will probably recommend, my guess is Yair Lapid for prime minister, because he'll have the second most seats in the Knesset. But because a minute ago I mentioned Lapid doesn't really have the capacity to put together a government. So now you're talking about a government which is led by Naftali Bennett or Gidon Saar to lead the anti-Netanyahu camp. That's where things start getting a little bit complicated in terms of working out the right wing and left wing uh, ideas. Uh, Bennett has said that if he's prime minister over that camp, he's not going to move forward on anything which is really an ideological divide between all the parties. Right now, the focus is on the economy, on health, and on healing the wounds in Israeli society, and will put aside all the other questions. But that's going to be tough for Bennett also because people are voting for him because of the ideology. So that's your question, Meira, is touching on the greatest challenge of the anti-Netanyahu camp. Because if you're going to get to 61 from all of those parties that don't want Netanyahu, you're talking about people who are ideologically quite right-wing and ideologically quite left-wing. And, and as, how will that work out? But if you're asking just the bottom line, where will labor fit, they will support whatever path will be an anti-Netanyahu government. This actually leads me really nicely into my next question, which is about merits. Um, on a panel that you actually moderated on, uh, for Telfed, uh, where we, you had a bunch of uh, candidates from, from the different parties. You actually had Laura Wharton from Merritt's on that panel. And one thing that struck me, and she said this, it was, it was very quick, but she said that Merritt's wants to be in a coalition. Now, I found this really interesting because Merritt's hasn't been in a coalition in a very, very long time. And they are absolutely left-wing. They consider themselves to be to the left of labor. So who would they really sit with in a coalition? Who would they sit under? They, they clearly have some idea if they're saying that they want to be part of a coalition. What would that look like? So this is, again, you're touching on, if you asked the question about labor before, <laughs> with merits, it's even more complicated. Labor says, 
I'm sorry, Meret says we are left wing, we are the left. And by the way, I think it's wonderful that a country has parties of all different ideologies and especially parties that don't waver whatsoever and say, this is who we are, this is what we believe in. And that's why Meretz has had pretty consistent low support because Israel has shifted rightward, but they do have the left wing in Israel that sees them as a basis, uh, as, as their representation in the Knesset. Uh, their dream would certainly be to have someone like Yair Lapid be prime minister and be a, a strong element of that government. I, I do not see, and it's true this Bennett has actually said outright, that he will not have merits in his government if he's prime minister. So it's a real complication. Uh, people who vote for merits are not voting for merits because they want to be in the government and have power to do X, Y, or Z. It's because there's an ideology and we're going to stick with it. And it's important for us to be in the Knesset, even if we're in the opposition. So if you're just asking me, as someone from the outside watching this all play out, I Assuming that it's true that Yair Lapid would vacate the dream of being prime minister so that someone else can replace Netanyahu, he could sit with a Bennett or a Saar, and they could sit with him in their government. I don't see either of them having merits as part of their government. Now, if you fine tune the question one more time and say, what if that government is lacking, lacking three seats? Let's say the whole anti-Netanyahu camp has come to 58. Could they find a way for merits to be part of it and put them over the finish line? I believe, with that sitting right in front of them, the answer is yes, that they really? will find some way to dodge all the disagreements because the desire in Yamina, in New Hope, in Yeshatid is so strong to replace Netanyahu. I don't think they would let that opportunity fall away just because it's a question of merits of being in the government or not. It would be a very, very difficult negotiation to figure out exactly how to make that work. So if we're already on that topic of, of who would be supporting what and under what circumstances, I do want to bring this to Yesha Tid and, and what your Lapid has been saying over the course of, uh, of the campaign. There was a point at which Lapid did express some interest or intention that should he be in a position to be prime minister or should he be in a position to help form a government that he would be willing to do that with support from the joint list. I don't know how serious that statement was. I don't know what that would look like. Do you see that as being a part of these negotiations? I'm going to be honest with you, and uh, I am not a member of Yeshatid, and I'm not uh, here, as you can tell, touting any party. Just from my time, extensive time spent with Yair Lapid and talking politics and policy and getting to know him as a person. I, again, this is just my observation. I see it very, very uh, unlikely that he would bring the joint list uh, into any kind of a government that he was trying to form, not because he's anti-Arab. And this is, by the way, for everybody in the government. I think that every single party, for the most part, from what I could tell, would be comfortable with Arabs who are uh, pro-Israel and supportive of living in Israel and, and being part of a Jewish state, being in their government. But it's anti-specifically the ideologies and things that have been said by leaders of and members of the joint list. I think it would be very, very difficult for him to do so. He sort of walked it back a little bit and said, I meant certain elements of it. Then there's this other idea, which is they're not part of the government but they vote to support the government. And I think that people have been misled about that point because they always say, oh, it's just for one vote. It's not just for one vote because they'll be needed for other issues uh, that will come up and you are then dependent on their support. So uh, I don't really see that, that happening. And again, I actually see today's announcement by Yair Lapid, he, he really broke his silence and showed up uh, to be interviewed, which by the way, he's been brilliant in terms of how he's played this campaign, letting Netanyahu sort of raise his profile and turn him into the enemy. Uh, but I think that his point today uh, was essentially saying, vote for Yeshatid, I'll be a senior, senior member of that government, but I understand that the only chance we have of replacing Netanyahu is likely if it's a if it's a Naftali Bennett or a Gidon Saar as the prime minister candidate. And if that's the situation, there's not a chance that the joint list uh, is going to be part of that. So I, I think that that was said at a period of time, but I don't think it's something to be taken seriously. Or do I think? Nor do I think it's something for a Yeshatid voter uh, to be concerned about. So now let's actually bring this to Yamina at this point. Bennett has been very explicit. He wants to be prime minister. Yamina is planning on recommending Bennett to be prime minister. At this point, at best, he is third or fourth in the polls with anywhere between nine to 
uh, let's say 12 or 13 at best seats, probably somewhere in the middle. He's neck and neck with Saar. We know that Lapid, even though he's expressed that he will sit back, does have significantly more seats. Does he have a chance to really make this happen and be prime minister? And what would the conditions be to allow that to happen? It's a really great question. Now, Tully Bennett has been the, the big question mark in this election campaign because on the one hand, so vigorously saying that Netanyahu has to be replaced, but on the other hand, not willing to say, I will not sit with the Netanyahu government under any circumstances. And therefore, anyone who is analyzing it says, so how is this going to play out? You're going to have 10 or 11 seats. Let, let's just play it out together. And by the way, it's important for everyone who is watching, especially New Olim, to understand that we're going to see results on election night. You might even see some celebrations at ballrooms. But that's just the very first part of the story of a very long process, as every single party will then be invited to the president's house. I was privileged to be in one of those meetings where you meet with the president and recommend who you view should be the prime minister. So what's going to happen? I mean, I'll be just very clear here, and I'll get to Bennett to answer your question. You're going to have Netanyahu getting somewhere around 50 seats, uh, saying that he should be prime minister, Likud, the Haredim, and religious Zionism. You'll have Lapid getting, let, let's just say, it'll be somewhere around the 30 range uh, that he should be uh, prime minister. You'll have Naftali Bennett's party saying he should be prime minister with 10 or 11 seats. And you'll have New Hope saying that Gidon Saar should be prime minister with 10 or 11 seats. Now, you're the president of Israel. Let's play a game for a moment. Your support, your mandate is give the ability to form a government to the person who has the best chance. At that point, it's Netanyahu. So, I mean, he, he's 20 seats beyond anybody else even close to him. So he'll be given four weeks to try to form a government. That's four weeks after the election, my friends, where nothing is essentially happening. You'll have 120 new members of Knesset, but that's it. And then he can ask for a two-week extension after that. So if the president wants to grant it to him, that's possibly six weeks where nothing is happening. Let's say he fails and he gives the mandate back to the president. Who's the president going to turn to next? It's not going to be Naftali Bennett. It's not going to be Gion Saar. It's going to be the Yair Lapid to try to form a government. I don't know that Lapid will drag out the full four weeks because I think he'll see pretty clearly that he's not able to do it. And then at that point, it goes back to the Knesset. This is very important. It goes back to the Knesset. And any member of Knesset can then work to try to form a government. From what I understand from the inside, and this could be completely not what's going to happen, but Naftali Bennett's camp is waiting for that stage to see can they at that point, can he then put together all these different parties together and be the prime minister with 61? He'll go to Lapid, he'll go to Gidon Saar, he'll go to Blue and White, he'll go to Labor, et cetera, and let's see where he can get with that approach. That's going to be the money time for Naftali Bennett. If he does not succeed in that case, does he then go back to Netanyahu and say, listen, you're sitting at 51. I can get you over the finish line and squeeze Netanyahu for every last drop to be able to get to the 61. But there's one last point we have to remember in all of this. And that is Netanyahu is in no rush to get to the 61 <laughs> if Bennett demands too much from him. Remember, if we go to a fifth election, who continues as prime minister until the fifth election? Netanyahu. And it's Netanyahu leading an interim government where he actually has somewhat more control than he does even in a new government that squeezes everything out of him. So that's why at the moment, I don't see the path for Bennett, going back to your question, to be prime minister and form a government, unless during that last stage, when anyone in the Knesset can do it, he's able to put together those parties. And then he comes forth to the president and says, I, as a member of Knesset, have found 60 other members to support my government, and here it is. So speaking of what would happen in terms of a fifth election, which I hope we don't get there, but <laughs> speaking of, let's talk about blue and white just very, very quickly, because I do want to move on to, uh, to some other things. Benny Gantz was the would-be prime minister. He was right there. He's still currently alternate prime minister. And in theory, there's a chance that depending on how things go, he couldn't actually become prime minister later in the year. They are right now on the, the right there at the threshold. Most of his campaign has focused on him being the, the stopper to, to Bibi's plans for unchecked power. Do you think that's actually accurate? And do you think it made a difference to the voters in, in that sense? 
Yeah, I'm amazed that Blue and White is even polling at the four or five that they're polling at. It's pretty remarkable. These are people who believe in Benny Gantz, who understand what he was doing by joining the government and trying to prevent a, a, another election. So uh, it's they are fighting for their lives. And just to explain to everyone again, you have to get 3.25% of the vote to get into the Knesset. It's about four seats. Uh, I was in the Knesset and voted on the law in 2014 to raise it to 3.25. We wanted to go higher, actually, and that was a compromise. But it's very important. If you do not get that 3.25, anyone who voted for you, those votes are lost. They just disappear. And now the 120 are split up amongst everybody else. So if Gantz doesn't cross the threshold, but gets, let's say, three seats instead of four, those three seats are then divided up amongst the other parties, and it actually goes to the higher parties first. So it actually benefits Likud. What is Gantz arguing? Gantz is saying, and this is what they're all over the place saying, that even on the chance that we go to a fifth election, we need to be in the Knesset because we'll also continue in our positions in the government and we'll stop Netanyahu from uh, being a dictator, in their words, during the interim government. Because if they're not there, this is very important, if blue and white is not there, if they don't cross the threshold, now they give up all of their ministries, they give up all of their positions in the committees, and the new Knesset has that, and that will be a Netanyahu run without any other ministers from the other parties. So that's their argument uh, to the Israeli people. Uh, it's desperation, that's for sure. Uh, Benny Gantz, by the way, has said in interviews I saw over the weekend that he still sees that maybe he can rebuild and become prime minister uh, of Israel no, one really. day, that he wants to be involved in politics. He has a lot to contribute. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. And that story in the era is actually the number one story of this election, because there are four parties that are at risk of perhaps falling below the threshold. By the way, right now, according to the polls, they're all crossing it. But that's Meretz. That's blue and white, a party we haven't talked about yet, the Religious Zionist Party. About to get right to them. The, there are well the could. And then there's an Arab party called Ra'am, which is the Islamic, uh, more radical Islamic party that's on their own, broke away from the joint list. And they're also in that mix. So that's going to be a big part of the story. And that's why, by the way, even when I said before, there might be celebrations on election night, there still might be a number of days of counting because if there's any party that's close to the threshold, it literally can mean 500 votes, 1,000 votes, 1,500 votes make the difference of them getting into the Knesset or not, and that reshapes the entire Knesset. So we're likely not going to have concrete results even about the 120 on election night. Okay, so now this is the last question in this rapid fire round that I want to get to before moving on, and that is, in fact, on the religious Zionist party. They have been insisting from day one they will only go with a right-wing government. Uh, based on what I've heard, they're, they're seemingly backing Netanyahu, not necessarily because they're so supportive of him, but it's rather from a, a place of practicality for them and, and who they think will have the best chance of having a right-wing government. If, however, the choice is between being out in the opposition or being in some sort of unity government, which is the only other real option at this point, do you think that they really are gonna stick with their plan and only stay with a right-wing government? Or do you see any option for them to go in a different direction? I see them sticking with it all the way. I see them going to the opposition if necessary and building themselves up as the only real legitimate right-wing party who stuck with their principles, even though it meant the opposition. And I think they'll grow from that. Remember, opposition is an opportunity if you're there for strong ideological reasons and you can show voters that they need to stick with you so that in the future, you'll be stronger and be able to have influence in the government. They will 100% stick with that, but it's, that's for two reasons. One is what I just said, but also, all the parties to the center left will never allow a situation for them to be in a government together with the religious Zionists because they see certainly the Otsma Yehudit side, Itamar ben -Gvir, and possibly the Noam party as well, which is that number six in the party. They see them as too radical extreme right for them to sit with. So uh, both by choice and by force, I don't think they'll be able to sit in any government other than an Netanyahu-led right-wing religious government. Right. Before we move on to our next uh, topic, I do just want to remind everybody who's just tuning in with us. We are speaking with former MK Rabbi Dove Littman as part of our Polytalk series with Karim House and Israeli Politics Simplified, going over some of these last minute pre-election briefs 
We've spoken about a bunch of the parties and what's been going with going on with their campaigns. And now I'd actually like to turn our focus to, to something a little bit more practical for some of our viewers. I, I know that I certainly get asked this a lot and I am a thousand percent sure that you get asked this a lot. As, as great as these events have been that we've been doing, and we really have spoken with a number of candidates and gotten to some very real questions about policy, at the end of the day, there's always going to be people that just don't have the time to sift through everything and watch through everything, and they really just want to know who they should vote for, how they should decide. And one thing I do want to mention is, uh, I know on my page, Israeli Politics Simplified, we actually shared one of these who should I vote for charts, not as any kind of endorsement. Of course not, um, but we share them as a discussion point and, and knowing that there are people that do actually want to see these charts and they feel that it provides some kind of guideline for figuring out how they should vote. And while I personally feel that they're far too oversimplified to really take literally, the question does remain. For those who are undecided and who aren't you know, as much in the thick of it as I know you and I are, how can they really come to this decision what would be a good guide for them to follow? Uh, I know that you deal with this a lot, so take it away. I'd really love to hear from you on this. I'll literally walk you through what I do with people who call me. And yes, the calls are, especially now, people are very confused. There's email messages, there's WhatsApp messages, there's Facebook questions and phone calls where people say, uh, just help me out. And I want to remember, remind everybody, when you go to vote, when you go behind that booth, you're going to see... 39 slips of paper, uh, which are very, very confusing. So it actually is important for you to do your homework beforehand so that you know exactly <laughs> what it is that you're looking for. My first question to everyone who asks me who I should vote for is I say to them, do you want Netanyahu to continue as prime minister or not? That's the first question. A lot of people don't know, and then I'll go through another series of questions, but that's the first question. If you feel that Netanyahu is the one that you want to continue, you feel that he's good for Israel diplomatically, security-wise, you know, historically, economically, and the vaccinations and all of that, this is the person that you want, then you essentially have three choices, uh, four choices, in terms of who to vote for. If you view yourself as being more extreme, like real hardcore right wing, and you come from a religious background, and you want to see sort of a religious overture in the government, then I say to vote for the religious Zionists. If you are Haredi, and you are someone who's interested in seeing a continuation of the Haredim being involved in the areas of government they've been involved with, housing and finance, and things along those lines, then you have to decide Shas Party or United Torah Judaism, and that's more real, real inside baseball in terms of uh, which way to go. If you're in neither of those camps and you're not looking for a religiously guided government per se, then you're only Likud voter. And uh, that's where you are in terms of the pro-Netanyahu camp. If you are anti-Netanyahu, you do not under any circumstances want to see Netanyahu continue as prime minister, then my next question is, are you right wing or left wing on the various security issues and the like? I don't really talk about the economics so much because most of Israel has shifted very much rightward and capitalistic in terms of uh, that, but I'll get to that in a moment. But if you're right wing on security issues and you're absolutely no Netanyahu, uh, then you have two choices. One is uh, New Hope, led by Gidon Saar, which is the Likud ideology, but saying no Netanyahu. Uh, but more traditional in nature, certainly willing to sit with the Haredim, willing to uh, do a, be in a government with the Haredi parties, or your option is Avigdor Lieberman and Yisrael Beitenu, who is right wing on security issues, but absolutely against Netanyahu. And here's the point, if you're anti-Haredi, uh, you don't want to see any Haredim involved on any level and somewhat comfortable with strong language against the Haredim, <laughs> which people very much might be, then Avigdor Lieberman is, is your person. If you don't see yourself as right wing, you see yourself as more center in terms of where your politics are, uh, and you want to see a party where, again, there is a leader who has been involved in the Knesset for a while and been involved in government, then your party is most likely Yesh Atid. And that's why in that anti-Netanyahu camp, Yesh Atid, led by Yair Lapid, is certainly the most successful in terms of where they are numbers wise. Uh, if you view yourself more to the left, not super left, but a little bit more to the left and a little bit more on the socialistic side in terms of uh, the uh, economy, 
Then labor very much might be your place. You should go watch Mirav Michaeli, see her speeches, see what she stands for. She doesn't hold back uh, what she believes. And that could be your camp. If you are solidly, solidly left wing, then your a party is merits. Now you've noticed there's two parties that I have not mentioned so far, and that's blue and white and Yamina. And I want to explain. It's very, very difficult for me to uh, push someone specifically towards the blue and white camp uh, ideologically. So what I would say is, if you identify, you're an anti-Netanyahu person, you identify with Benny Gantz as a leader, you uh, support the fact that he tried to go into the government of Netanyahu to prevent an election, you value some of the things his party has done in this uh, government, very difficult government, mm -hmm. in terms of trying to protect certain aspects of the judicial system and other elements, then look into Benny Gantz for sure. That takes us to Yamina, where uh, Naftali Bennett, you cannot vote for Yamina, in my opinion, if you're solidly, solidly no Netanyahu, or if you're solidly, solidly yes Netanyahu. If you're somewhat parent, meaning, yeah, I'd love to see a new leader, but it's not the end of the world if Netanyahu continues as prime minister, and then you like someone who, and Bennett has been out there with very clear policies in terms of how he wants to deal with the economy, the Singapore plan, transform Israel's economy, someone who certainly has very well thought out policies and is definitely a potential future leader for Israel, then you should definitely look at Yamina, but you have to be at peace with the possibility that he might go with a Netanyahu government or he might lead a government that has parties that are more to the center left. And you have to be uh, you know, amelioble in that way to be able to accept any of that. So that's basically uh, my list. Oh, I should also mention, because it's only fair, uh, if you want to see uh, the joint list of the Arab parties, uh, if that's where your sentiments are, uh, and I've certainly met uh, certainly you know Jewish voters who feel that Arab Israel needs greater representation, then you should definitely look at the joint list. And if you support the more radical Islamic side, then Ram might be uh, your address. So I've covered pretty much all the parties that uh, have gone uh, across the threshold, uh, according to the polls. Remember, we're just 20 more parties that are not even part of that. But I think at this point in time, it's worthwhile to focus on those that are crossing the threshold and not those that really, from anything that I can tell, uh, don't have any chance because that might be an ideological vote, but your, your vote's not going to go anywhere because there won't be representation uh, in the Knesset. How did I do? That was about five, six minutes. I think that was really good, actually. You know, for me, I find that when people ask me who they should vote, I also kind of go through these base questions. Usually it's the highlights. Sometimes I'll ask, well, who have you voted for in the past? Is there a reason that you wouldn't want to vote for them again? And who would you be deciding between? I, of course, ask, where do you stand on security issues? Are you more right and left? Uh, and, and about how you feel about Netanyahu. Uh, I find that a lot of people that I speak to tend to get tripped up between um, Bennett, Saar, and Lapid. Um, and those that lean more left, they also wonder if they should be taking labor into account. So I do find that it, it becomes more difficult for the people that are sort of in that range um, and trying to decipher the differences. If you could choose, if you could list like five things or, or three things that are the main differences between those four, what would you focus most on? Okay, so first of all, the truth is between those four, I have an easier time. And, okay. and I feel terrible that I'm not talking ideology with you. I wish I could tell you, mm -hmm. oh, this one supports this versus this, and that people can, but uh, this uh, elections are not really about them. So it's very, very straightforward to me if, with those four parties sort of in the middle. If you are someone who has made a decision that you absolutely do not want to see Netanyahu running for uh, continuing as prime minister, but you see yourself as right wing when it comes to Judea and Samaria, security issues, very much in the right wing camp, then Gidon Saar and New Hope is, is your party. Uh, if you uh, are right-wing ideologically uh, and you kind of sway, it, it, it can be Netanyahu or, or not Netanyahu, um, you're not necessarily committed, you don't, you don't have a problem going more with the right-wing, more towards a little bit of the left, but you want someone who has certainly proven himself as, as a leader with plans and ability to carry them out, uh, Bennett has been defense minister. He was defense minister during Corona. He was education minister. He was economy minister. Then Yamina is, is very much your place, assuming that you're right wing uh, on the security issues. If you're not right wing, so now it's a question of Yesha Teed or labor. Uh, if you view yourself a little bit more in the center, uh, pragmatic, 
uh, you know, certainly willing to work with with uh, people even on the right. Uh, that's the Ishatid. And if you view yourself more to the left, not not far left, but more to the left on security issues, more to the left on economy issues, then labor uh, would be your place. So, uh, you know, that's why the first question is always, you know, firmly yes Netanyahu or no Netanyahu. And then if you're sort of in the middle, uh, then right wing and then Yamina could definitely be an address for you. Before we finish up, because I know that uh, we're running out of time, one thing that you and I discussed on our first event uh, was about how we should be approaching these parties, what we should be asking from them and trying to decipher who we should vote for, what their platforms are. And I think that we did in our, in our events with the candidates, we really did try very hard to pay attention to platform plans, how they were going to accomplish that. We asked the same questions to each candidate to make sure that we were getting information from each candidate on those issues. I'd really like to hear from you uh, during this campaign season, do you feel like the campaigns and the parties have been putting out sufficient information about their platforms and plans for Israel on a very various different issues? Who do you feel has done the best at putting out those plans and being very clear about what their plans are? I'd like to hear from you about that. Sure. So first of all, uh, I think it's so important that you ask that question because I just very oversimplified everything. And mm -hmm. you should go do your research and see and understand what they stand for. One of the reasons why I oversimplify it is because I've been in the Knesset. I've been in a party that was in the government in a coalition. And I understand that you cannot fulfill uh, most of what you promised, not because you misled anybody, but because of Israel's system of the coalition and, and having to work with other parties, you have to decide very quickly what you're going to give up on in order to sit in a in a successful coalition. So no, no, no one should, when you look at those parties, no one should ever say, oh my goodness, uh, you know, I hope they carry out all, all these plans and then be let down when they don't, uh, because it's just the reality of being in the Knesset, which prevents that. Having said that, there is no doubt that uh, Yamina has put out very clear plans for many things. New Hope has put out very clear plans. Yesha Teed has put out very clear plans. They've really laid it out there in terms of their ideologies about a variety of issues um, and, and everyone should do their research. I'm not saying other parties have not. I'm just saying those are the ones that really stick out in my mind in terms of where they've laid it out very clearly or have also led the way uh, in terms of doing that. So for example, like if I go to merits on the one side or religious Zionists on the other side, they say outright, you know, what they stand for and what they want to do, but there's no chance within the framework of a coalition government that those parties with their four or five seats can actually move forward uh, with all of those issues. So you have to be realistic as well when you look at it. So that's why some of those parties, which are more quote unquote in the center and a little bit larger, they have a better chance of carrying out things that they've promised, but no one will be able to do a hundred percent. And then you have to start listening to what are the priorities? Like what are the number one issues uh, that they talk about. So for example, when it comes to Yamina, they seem to be talking about the economic issues as the number one point. When you talk to New Hope, they seem to be talking about judicial reform and electoral reform as their number one issue. When you go to Yishatid, they seem to be talking about some of the religion and state issues as being their number one issues that they want to address and, and some of the equality issues in Israel. So it's important just to listen to some of the messages and just try to hear what are the number one issues that are raising to the fore and maybe understand that that might be their priority if they come to a government and other things are going to have to be left to the side. So before we finish up, because I know that we're just about out of time, very generally, broadly, quickly, if you could tell us, where do you think we're going to wind up at the end of this election? Do you think the polls are accurate? Do you see us getting all the way to that third option of somebody in Knesset trying to cobble together 61? What do you see happening here? So first of all, on election night, uh, I'm going to be on ILTV. You can watch the broadcast okay. and you'll see when the results are announced. And you'll see all of us sitting there as if we're the big experts knowing what we're talking about. And in reality, I mean, you should watch and uh, hopefully we'll have insights, but we're also somewhat shooting in the dark in terms of what's going to happen. Um, uh, my guess is that we will reach that third stage of the process, because I, I, unless it's a surprise, and somehow there's numbers that are just way beyond what the polls had expected. Um, and then at that point, it is possible that something could happen one way or another. That could either be a Netanyahu government or not a Netanyahu government. And the possibility of the fifth election is definitely not an impossibility uh, at this time. What I would say to especially New Olim is to have a lot of patience. Uh, this is a long process. 
And usually things only happen at the very last second when we're on the brink of some kind of uh, crazy thing happening, like giving back the mandate to the president or going to a fifth election, whatever it is, then sometimes all kinds of walls come crumbling down and things happen. But it's going to be a long, drawn-out process. I don't have a doubt that we'll continue to speak uh, during that process to try to explain to people what exactly is going on. I hope with us. What's that? (laughs) I hope with us. <laughs> I'm saying together with you. Yeah. Um, and and uh, just to be patient, understand that there's a process. And what I share with everyone, I shared with you last time as well, is on a certain level when you go to vote, as crazy as it is that you're going to see 39 different slips of paper in front of you. By the way, whatever party you vote for, make sure that you only take one slip of paper. If accidentally two are stuck together and you put it in the envelope, your vote is disqualified. Make sure there's not even a little mark, a pen mark or something like that on your slip, because that will be disqualified as well. So just be very, very precise. Take your time. Don't feel rushed to make sure you do it properly. But I would also say when you take that envelope and you put it into the box, just remind yourself of what you're experiencing that you are a Jew in the state of Israel, in the land of Israel, in the 21st century, voting democratically for your leader. And maybe have this vision in your mind of your great, great, great grandmother, you know, davening over the Shabbat candles, praying to God that the czar be nice to them, or that whatever dictator, wherever they're living, doesn't kill Jews that week. And just think about what we're going through now, and hopefully that will fill you with inspiration and great thanks for the opportunity that we've been blessed with. You know, we didn't talk a lot about ideology, but I think that was a perfect, broader ideological note to end on. Uh, The truth is, is that we don't focus on it enough during elections. We get very much down into the nitty gritty and, uh, you know, the mudslinging and who's doing better than who and why. And at the end of the day, the fact that we're even able to have those conversations in Israel, in modern times with our own government is uh, something that uh, is important, I think, for all of us to remember. So thank you for reminding us of that, and that there really is something greater happening beyond this. Uh, so thank you, Rabbi Lippman, for joining us. I think this was a great way to kind of get everybody ready to, to head into elections on Tuesday. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. Happy Elections Day, everybody. And thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to follow the Karim House and Israeli Politics Simplified pages to hear about any more upcoming events in the Poly Talk series. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.